Hello friends, this is Reflections, a program sponsored by Paducah Cooperative Ministry where together we do God's work with human hands. I'm uh, your co-host Karen Winkle, I pastor United Church of Paducah here in Paducah and your other co-host is Gregory Waldrop who pastors Fountain Avenue United Methodist Church. Good to see you Gregory. Glad to be here with you, always. Mm -hmm. It's a good, good thing. Good thing and a good work mm -hmm. that we share. It's glad you all are with us this, for this program. Monthly, we have a Bible study, and we're glad to continue that. We've been working our way through the parables of the Gospel of Luke, and we have with us the pastor at the Reedland Christian Church, Zach Browning. Welcome, Zach. Glad to be here. Glad you're here. Anything to report from a Reedland Christian these uh, days? Got, got a lot of things happening, as usual, in ministry. We've uh, been reaching out into the community, been uh, helping out at some schools. Uh, recently, I just got certified to teach uh, first aid and CPR for the Red Cross, so we've been partnering with them and, uh, you know, a few different things looking forward to what's going to be going on and uh, kind of planning ahead for the future. we got some summer camps and all kinds of stuff, so keep them busy. Great. Mm -hmm. Where's summer camp? What, which summer camp? Uh, our support? church supports a camp in uh, Aurora, Kentucky. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Ohio Valley Christian Camp. Right. And uh, looking forward to that down on the lake. Good deal. Beautiful. Well, we're yeah. glad you're here. Glad to and be. And glad for everything you do in this community. Our uh, study this week is the a familiar one, the Good Samaritan. It is tenth, most familiar. Yeah, the 10th chapter of Luke. Mm -hmm. you, I'll read. That'd be great. If, if you don't mind, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. This is Luke 10, 25 through 37. And as Gregory said, it's most familiar. And so we'll listen to that and uh, find um, in it what, what it's offering us today. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what's written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of those parables I think you learn even before you learn to read. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. You always hear people talking about this. And I think I, I'm glad that you read the first couple verses because a lot of people just jump to the story. Mm -hmm. And I really like the fact that <clears throat> that this man comes and it, it, it uh, just starts out and it says that he's testing Jesus. And I think that's interesting that, you know, it gives you an idea of the climate. A lot of people aren't familiar with the fact that Jesus was constantly battling these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious groups. And this was just another test. They were trying to trip him up. And, uh, you know, when, when Jesus asks him the question back, which is an excellent way of getting people to learn, you know, so what do you think? You know, and, and building on their statements, uh, he, the man gives a very correct statement. You know, love the Lord your God uh, and, you know, love your neighbor. And I think that is an absolutely wonderful thing. And then is when he, he begins to test Jesus again and he says, well, who's my neighbor? And that opens up a different can of worms. And I think that's a good question for us to ask ourselves. Who are uh, our neighbors? You know, is it the people that we live next door to? Yes. Is it the people that we go to work with? Yes. Our families, anybody that's around us. 
And uh, Jesus does an excellent job of telling this story uh, to really get to the heart of the matter, which I think is a, 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 good, uh, a good way to teach. And Jesus knew that. You know, he was, a, he was a talker. He liked to tell stories, and people could say, yeah, I get that. You know, it wasn't taking a test or, you know, lecturing. It was storytelling. Right. Uh, it may be particularly important for us to take seriously what this is trying to say. I've always held it against Jesus a little bit that both of these people who pass mm -hmm. by the fellow on the road are preachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The but they, they were off the, the clock, Gregory. They were off the clock. Well, they, they were headed were... <laughs> to something. Yeah, and they so were. And so it's the preachers that wander by and that are particularly unable, unwilling for whatever reason, uh, to, to not to stop and be the caregiver to, to, to tend to them. So maybe uh, us preachers ought to pay closest attention to this. Definitely. And I think it's a little, you know, in a subtle way, Jesus is kind of shaming the people into it. He says, you are the ones that know better. You know, the, the priest and the Levite, you know, that priestly heritage in the families. You know that these people need help, but you just keep on walking by. And then uh, given the group of people that he was talking to, I don't think people expected him to mention a Samaritan next. I think, you know, he was going down a, a line of social, uh, you know, standing, and he started with the priests, which were very high, and then he got down to the Levites, which had a good background. And, you know, maybe they were looking for a different, you know, just the common Jew of the day. And for him to switch to, uh, you know, this Samaritan, which in the Jews' eyes was a half-breed, you know, partly Jew, but they had, you know, went away and intermingled and married with other people and stuff. I think Jesus shocked a lot of people when he talked about the Samaritan because maybe, you know, people were saying, well, if these two didn't, then I, you know, maybe some of us common people are going to be the Savior. Yeah. And it turns out that it's people that they just can't stand. So, you know, Jesus does a good job of setting everybody on their ear. Right, so to Springing a surprise attack here mm -hmm. uh, in this, and uh, very clear. Mm -hmm. But it's ironic, you know, for us because we've so lost that element, it. Yeah. lost that that you know, when we say good Samaritan, you know, that's a that's a high form right. of praise. Sure, somebody you rather right. than you know, we don't hear the you know the slap that it would would be or the shock that it would be to. Um, yeah, you're right. We think of that, you know, and we have good Samaritan laws. You know, like I said, I've recently been working with the Red Cross, right, and that's one of the right. things that they want us to stress when we're teaching first aid and CPR is that if you're doing something good, there's laws in place that if you're not intentionally trying to cause harm, you know, if you're trying to do something good, that uh, and they're named good Samaritan mm -hmm. laws, you know, that you can't be prosecuted, you can't be sued. And a lot of people don't have a, a clear idea of what the Samaritan was. You know, and, and what he had to do. And to back up a little bit, I, I was doing a little looking. I don't know if you're familiar with Ray Vanderlyn. Uh, he does a lot of uh, video teachings and some, you know, things. I, I really respect his work. He has a, a video series of where he traveled along this road. And this road is not, I would, I would probably be cramped on it. Uh, just, it's a very small road and there's a huge ravine. This ditch or cavern or whatever they call, you know, depending on the translation, is actually a very long ravine. So when people would, uh, would see this person, you know, especially the two preachers, it wasn't that they just kind of said, I don't think I'm going to, you know, go down that way or I don't think I'm going to be there. They were literally almost fearing for their life because they didn't want to get caught in that same position that he was in. And also, if they were going to go around him, they would either have to climb up a rock or they would have to get down in that ravine to kind of get around him. So it wasn't just, I don't think I really want to help him. They were going out of their way to avoid this man, you know, for a variety of reasons too. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there was always the blood issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we know a little more about the chemistry and some of the details of it. We've got more awareness and maybe more uh, virulent blood-borne diseases, but blood was always an issue for folks there. They make a point, uh, the, the, the passage makes a point that he bound his wounds, he dared to get in the middle of all that blood a business. He poured oil and wine, a pretty elaborate, uh, generous, luxurious kind of a treatment uh, for the infections and all that sort of thing. And then unbelievably generously, almost as if he left his credit card open mm -hmm. in our day to say, take care of this, this stranger. And uh, not just a stranger, but um, perhaps a person who might have some prejudice against him. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the end, mm -hmm. uh, it would be maybe like an illegal alien, or mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trying to think about people who in 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 our culture, you know, this could be happening in Arizona or you know along right. the Texas border. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who is. It's definitely a unique situation, and it I think. The reason Jesus tells this story is obviously we're supposed to care for people, you know, to the best right. of our ability. But I think the thing that's different about this man is that he doesn't just help him out. He almost takes it upon himself to make sure that right. everything is okay it's with this lavish. man. It's mm -hmm. lavish. It's lavish. Yeah. Isn't it? It's really generous. It's, it's enormously. He doesn't spare anything, you know. He's, he's giving them the best treatments, the finest, you know, medical attention at this time, you know, that could be offered. And then after he does get him kind of back to health, he doesn't just say, hey, well, Hope everything goes well for you. You know, he puts him up in an inn, lets him to rest, maybe heal a little bit more, you know, by relaxing a little bit. And then he says, if anything, you know, more needs to be done, what, next time I'm back through here, I'll take care of it. And I think that's, that kind of shows us what we should be doing with other Christians that are in need, and especially non-Christians that we're reaching out to. We should take it upon ourselves to make sure that, that they're, you know, okay. Not maybe the shotgun idea where we just throw a lot of stuff out there and hope that it hits somebody, but actually see somebody that's in need and help, you right. know, and really take it upon ourselves to make sure that they get the full treatment. And I think that's, you know, not only in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, that's what we're called to do. Right. I know in uh, professional kind of circles, uh, there, there's this uh, old temptation to distance yourself from the people with whom you connect. Uh, even, even the words we use, we don't call people neighbors, we call them clients. Or we call mm -hmm. them whatever, all the other words we have that just pushes people a little back, uh, pushes people a little bit back. And here, he really does, this neighbor, this, this, this name of neighbor really is a tender name. I mm -hmm. mean, it denotes intimacy, it denotes mm -hmm. care, it denotes all the ways that we are, in fact, uh, our brother and sister's keeper mm -hmm. in, in, in these. And I think we've kind of lost, you bring up a really good point, we've lost the idea of what a neighbor is. Uh, and I'm, I'm blessed to have a very close-knit neighborhood that I live in. Uh, the other day, uh, my wife and I were clearing some uh, shrubs out of the backyard and getting some uh, you know leaves and things that needed to be done and um, we borrowed a truck and I, I ended up getting it stuck in the backyard because it was so muddy and you know my first thought was how am I gonna get this out there's nobody around and within 10 minutes both neighbors on my left and my right side and a couple people from about a block over you know heard us trying to um, you know kind of pump the the gas and get you know the truck out and stuff and I had all these people just come and they helped me get that out and I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself you know and in bigger uh, cities and bigger towns you kind of lose the idea of a neighbor mm -hmm. people used to have these big front porches and they invited people to you know come and talk and, and you know kind of enjoy some conversation and now we big uh, build big backyards and you know the big deck out on the back you people had these big parlors in the front of their house and now people have these big dens and the man cave that you know the guy retreats to with his big screen TV and his you know uh, sports or video games or whatever he's into and it seems that people have really lost the idea of what a neighbor is mm. you know treating each other with respect helping each other out uh, and I think the, the Amish folks really have a hold on it yeah. when the tornadoes and there were some fires that uh, ripped through in, in the past few years it always seemed like the ones that were affected the whole community came together right. and, and took care of everything in fact they don't even have insurance because they count on each other and that's something that I, I find absolutely amazing mm. is that they know that their neighbors are going to be there so so they don't worry. That is their insurance, right. their <laughs> assurance. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Exactly. They have that assurance. Well, I'm, um, if I might move us in just a little bit, I'm very interested in, in just the very beginning. And so we have that most powerful um, story that lifts up our, really, our interconnectedness and the surprise of who, who can minister to whom. But um, it be, the story begins with this question what must I do? to inherit eternal life. And at my church, we're reading a book by Brian McLaren called The Secret Message of Jesus. And Brian McLaren is um, uh, quite prolific and, um, and yet is someone that um, folks in my church aren't all that familiar with. And in, in that book, Brian McLaren, and I know others have done it um, as well, uh, really reframes eternal life as not a later thing. Not what do I need to get my reward, 
you know, and the great by and by, but is a quality that exists now. Mm -hmm. And that I think is, is um, challenging for us. I think folks, um, <coughs> it's easier to think about earning for reward than there's something that's available now and we can enter into that or not. Right. Yep. And I think it, it challenges people to realize that it's a free gift. It's, as you said, there's no earning. There's nothing that we can do, uh, you know, to, to make God say, all right, you've done it. You know, that's, you've helped three old ladies across the street and you, you know, uh, helped some, you know, save somebody's life and you've given me enough money, you know, over the years in church. Now you've earned eternal salvation. It's a free gift. And it's, it's interesting that this man asked that question, what must I do? And he asks it, and then after Jesus asks him a question, he gives the right answer. So he knew. He knew exactly what to do, you know, as a good Jew. But Jesus takes it to that next level. And he says, you've got a pretty good answer. Now are you living it out? You know, are you living that answer? Right. I, I, I think this year, as we talked about Easter, as I thought about Easter, I came across that in a couple of ways, this notion about eternal life having a, a you know, real present implications and activities. I, I think it became clear for me that in the particular resurrection passage we were looking at that uh, Jesus says, you know, let's, we need not look at time or at life in a linear fashion as if it were on and on and on out there and the one who was the best was the one who lived the lengthiest but I think he was trying to talk about the eternal proportions to every moment mm. of life to the depth and the height uh, eternally deep eternally high of every moment of life that in fact part of what I, I love the fact <coughs> that uh, in my passage it talks it was behold I keep saying behold all the time behold and that Jesus is all the time trying to get us to notice what's happening right now mm -hmm. and what's happening here he says behold in order to get us to pay attention to all the possibilities sure. again the eternal cosmic possibilities of every moment sure. mm -hmm. and, and I, that that washed over me in mm -hmm. this this notion of resurrection as well mm -hmm. and I, I think uh, I think it was uh, clearly a part of what they understood as eternal life as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, the folks in Bible days didn't have a lengthy life, most of them, to look forward to. They were looking forward to a value added to every moment. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in uh, another section, Jesus talks about, I'm here to offer you life and, you know, life more abundantly, or the actual translation is life and more life. And a lot of people, they, it's exactly what you're saying. They think that, okay, well, I got to wait until I die to get my crown in heaven or I get, you know, to get my reward. And when you're freed of your sin, when you're freed of, you know, all that junk that you've done in your life, when you give your life to Christ, when you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, that's when eternal life starts. You know, eternal life is wiping away all that junk, the, you know, the negative, that, uh, you know, that close feeling where you're just, okay, is somebody going to find me out? Is somebody going to, you know, uh, are they going to know the real me versus just giving yourself to Christ and saying, I'm a new person. You know, I'm a new creature. I, I love that when, when, you know, Paul writes, the old is gone and the new has come. You know, and a lot of people, um, you know, I hesitate to say it because it, it can sound very negative. It can sound very condemning. But when Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life and nobody comes to the Father but through me, that is, that's our ticket to salvation. If we believe that with all our heart, accept Him into our life and act upon that, you know, that, that's where it's at. And if without that, it's just, you know, the regular run of the mill. And we have to make that decision, you know, to follow that and accept that new life. And when we do, we shouldn't be the same. You know, if, if you come to know Christ and nothing in your life changes, I, I, I can't see that you've actually figured out really who Christ is. Mm -hmm. Because when there's such freedom in what He offers, you know, there's that freedom of uh, if you're hurt, you know that people are going to take care of you because you're part of that family. You know, there's a freedom in knowing that your sins have been forgiven and that you're part of Christ's family. You're part of God's kingdom. You know, you're not just sort of out there. And you know, I think there's something to that. Well, that people don't realize that real life and new life begins when you accept Christ. Right, and, and 
in my tradition, we would push it even further to say, you accept Jesus into your life by these actions. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus doesn't say, go and think like this. Mm -hmm. He says, go and do likewise. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. He said, don't, he didn't say go and uh, accept this for truth. He said, go and act. Exactly. And it, this is the way we accept Jesus. This is the way we welcome Jesus into our lives, into our community, mm -hmm. into our world, yep. is by this faithfulness that God gives us all to live and to be. Uh, it's, you know, we, we, I, I, we, we, I think we, are tempted to separate the acceptance of Jesus and the faithfulness of Jesus too clearly. And mm -hmm. you know, I had a friend who reminded me that the word believe is actually a compound Anglo-Saxon word. Its root is by life. Mm -hmm. And that if you wanted really to say what its ancient origins were, believe means to live by. When you say Jesus, believe in Jesus, you are actually saying live by Jesus' mm -hmm. way. Exactly. And that's, I love that Jesus does that because the man says we need to love, which is, you know, an inner emotion for most of us. It's, right. you know, we, we, we need to love the Lord our God and we need to love our neighbor. Right. And Jesus says, I'll show you how to love your neighbor. Yeah, in fact, the, the, first, uh, the first sermon that he preaches, we're going through the uh, Sermon on the Mount on Sunday nights in our Bible study, and uh, he, he turns everybody's view of Jewish law on its ear because he says, you've heard it was says, don't, you know, don't murder. Well, I tell you, don't hate your brother. Mm -hmm. You know, you're murdering them in your heart. You've heard it was say, you know, do not commit adultery. But I say, if you lust after a woman, you know, you're, you're committing adultery in your heart. And he goes down these commands where a lot of people can say, well, I've never killed anybody or I've never cheated on my wife or my right. husband. But most of us, you know, we we've saw that person that cuts us off in traffic and we might not have killed him, but boy, we sure would have liked to. You know, we've, we've seen those people that are out, you know, we're out with our families on, you know, on a nice Friday night at the mall shopping or at Applebee's and somebody comes in and they're dressed a little scantily clad and, you know, we have that look and, you know, we've, we've never actually done the deed, but we thought about it. And Christ is saying here, it's good that you know it. You know, it's good that you know in your heart that you're supposed to love people, but how do you live that out? Are you making it real? You know, are you living your faith out? And it may, I think it may be one of the reasons the, uh, the church has lost some of its vitality is that, I mean, it really does take a church to help us live that out. It doesn't take a church to keep it in our mind. Uh, we can sort of uh, mentally claim the words almost anywhere with pretty, not much, but to live it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and to interact and to have to deal with all the variations of uh, we humans are and how we humans live, it really does take a church to support it, to discern, to clearly encourage us to keep that fresh and lively and whole. Sure. I agree. And I think that's, a lot of us forget that this is, should be lived out in the church. You know, a lot of us are, are probably not going to be that overwhelmingly excited about going and helping somebody we don't know if we've never done that before. But if there's people in our church who have fallen in a pit, you know, who have been hurt and need to be taken care of, if we get in the habit of helping our brothers and sisters and then we step it out, you know, into the community, into the world and live that faith out, that gets us ready. You know, that gets us ready to live that word out. And that's where it starts at. Right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, I often liken this passage to the Sodom and Gomorrah text because the Sodom and, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, we all make it out as if it were a sexual sin, but it's very clear uh, in reading it. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is the inability to entertain strangers. Mm -hmm. Is the the sin was the the inhospitality. Mm -hmm of this, of Sodom particularly, mm -hmm. to these strangers that had come in, uh, these angels actually that had come in and visited with Lot mm -hmm. and uh, from Abraham. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very, I, I, I think uh, this notion of how we treat our neighbor, including the strangers that are among us, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. an urgent salvation issue and mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting at the very, very end, you know, Jesus tells this 
this story, there's this conversation, he tells the story and then, you know, he begins with some questions and then he ends with a question. He says, you know, which of the three um, was a neighbor? And the response is the one who showed mercy. Mm. And that's a powerful, powerful word. Now, I didn't do a word study to see what it, you know, what it says in, in the Greek, but mercy is a, a powerful word because it's, you know, it, that's a, a, a quality that attends a person's um, caring, I guess. You know, I mean, you can, you can do that, you know, you can do that rescuing. You can even be generous in it and, and not be merciful. Really? Really. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can just do it because it needs to be done, and we mm. do that all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I speak in the tongues of mm -hmm. angels but mm -hmm. have not love. Exactly. Noisy God. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I guess this can mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have the same tin mm -hmm. ring to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the way that I envision this is, you know, the, the, the person who is, is truly responsive, who is, is merciful in the story, is someone who's connected to being on the receiving end of that himself, mm. so that he's not operating out of his own source but this guy cares because he experiences that same sort of lavish care mm -hmm. from God. And yes. that is important to me because it's easy for me sometimes to feel like I'm, I'm using what I have. And instead, you know, we can afford to be generous if we're using what's been given to us. Mm -hmm. Because that source is um, unending. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people forget that. They forget that the blessings are from God. And that even though, you know, their bank account's big or they've got that car in that house that they've always wanted, it's a blessing from God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we don't use those blessings that He gives mm -hmm. us to bless other people, if that we don't continue that flow, they might be cut off from us. Mm -hmm. You know, and Jesus is, is very clear in saying, you've, if you have the opportunity, it doesn't matter what position in life you are, you can reflect the love of God, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you really even get back to that point where uh, you see here that they, they're unwilling to even say that it was a Samaritan. They say the one that showed mm -hmm. mercy, and yeah. it's that character. Yeah. And I think that's the thing here is we have to look at the character of the man that helped. Yeah. We have to leave it at that, yeah. and we're going to leave this story with you to chew on some more and live out wherever you can, however you can. Yeah. Uh, with Paducah Cooperative Ministry, we're doing God's work with human hands. We thank you, uh, thank you. Zach Browning of uh, Reedland Christian Church for being with us. Good to be with you, Gregory. You as well. Do join us again here at Reflections and uh, with Paducah Cooperative Ministry. Let, let us uh, do God's work with our human hands. Shalom. Shalom.